This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, I'm very sick, but it is the end of the year. And so we interrupt your regularly scheduled this week in video game programming to bring you this special episode. A look back at all the craziest shit that went down in this nightmarish year known as 2021. If you are new to the channel this year, you might not know that This Week in Video Games is a relatively new phenomenon in these here parts. One year ago, almost to the day, I uploaded this video, which was a look back at the games and events that shaped 2020. I had such a good time making that, and people enjoyed it enough that on January 19th, 2021, I nervously released the first ever edition of This Week in Video Games. I was certain that everyone would hate it and be like, uh, this sucks, stick to the boat metaphors, please. But surprisingly enough, people didn't hate it. And so I uploaded another and another. Since then, we haven't missed a single week and I've had so much fun making these because they let me share with you guys what I think about what's going on in this crazy hobby of ours. I love video games, but I also love how they're made. The stories about the creative, technological and commercial parts of video games are fascinating because this is the largest entertainment form on the planet and it's also the most rapidly evolving. Five years ago, free to play was basically like League of Legends and Dota. Now look at it. Five years ago, Fortnite was this low-key PvE tower defense game that no one gave a shit about. Now it plays host to music concerts and movie screenings and you can play as Master Chief and teabag Ariana Grande. Five years ago, NFTs didn't even exist. God, those were good times. Point is, a lot can happen in this industry in a pretty short span of time. And I think this year is a good example of that. So let's take a look back at the games, events, industry happenings and people that define 2021. Question, did you all get rich in January? If you didn't, then that's because you weren't following the guidance of our Lord and Savior, deep fucking value, as he shepherded his flock to the greatest pump in the history of pumps. This was the month that Slash R Wall Street Bets decided that they wanted the invisible hand of the market to be their muscular, lotioned hand. And so they vigorously stroked GameStop stock price until it was fully erect at an impressive 347 US dollars, up from a low of around $3.50 just a year prior. It was hilarious to see just how hard both Wall Street and Congress pushed back on this, incredulous that the pause dared defy the will of the money masters of the universe. It was a short-lived thrill as the dumps eventually set in, but to know that a video game retailer was the battleground on which this classless conflict transpired was kind of cool. In some ways, January 2021 felt like an awkward extension of December 2020 as the aftershocks of Cyberpunk's disastrous launch continued to ripple outwards. It was in January that CD Projekt Red co-founder Marcin Iwinski put out an apology video that really glossed over some important details and also implied like, oh, many of the issues you all discovered didn't appear in our testing. Sure, buddy. This happened at the same time as Jason Schreier of Bloomberg publishing an expose detailing the fact that most CD Projekt Red staff knew the game was busted prior to launch. Plus, like, we all played it. The suggestion that anyone was in the dark about this stuff was just a total lie. Even though Cyberpunk released in 2020, it was also one of the biggest news stories for all of 2021, as we rarely went a month without some aspect of its failure reverberating. It was only last week that CD Projekt Red settled a lawsuit brought by investors claiming to be misled, and it was only a month ago that CD Projekt Red announced that the next-gen ports of Cyberpunk were being delayed. I suspect we'll be talking about and learning from Cyberpunk for many, many years to come. It's a tragedy in the classic Greek sense, a fall from grace unlike any we'd seen. Cyberpunk taught me a lot about hype, about trusting companies, about how to approach shady review embargoes, and about how to separate the work of developers from the decisions of management. I'm all but certain that as Cyberpunk gets patches, new additions, and expansions, that it will come to be a much-loved video game, but its role as a cautionary tale will be the most enduring aspect of its legacy. January also saw the release of Hitman 3, one of the most celebrated titles of the year, and one that I did not play. That bums me out. As I talk about time loop games, everyone's like, dude, you gotta play Hitman. And yeah, you're right. The truth is, I haven't played any of the new Hitman games, and that is a point of great shame for me. I'll try to find some time for them next year. Oh, and the medium hit as well. I like this one, but a lot of people did not, and people got really pissed off when it was later announced that the developer, Bloober Team, are working on a Silent Hill game. Kinda hard to be the other guy when everyone is thirsting for a Kojima Del Toro duet. Best of luck, Bloober Team. You guys are gonna need it. Stadia. Stadia. My god. 
When Steady was first unveiled, I was quite excited about it because I've always been a fan of cloud streaming technology. The idea that anyone can play any game regardless of their hardware is awesome. And Google were promising all sorts of cool features like the ability to watch a gameplay trailer of a game and then immediately, seamlessly transition into playing that game through Stadia. That would have been awesome. Similarly, games develop from the ground up with the cloud in mind, tapping into vast amounts of processing power to deliver us experiences we've never had before. The reality of Stadia was so different. None of these promised features ever eventuated, but more terminally, the business model just sucked. Stadia didn't tap into your existing game libraries and ecosystems. You had to buy all of your games on Stadia. And given how often Google stand up and then abandon new technology, it was an extremely risky wager to bet your money on Stadia going the distance. Case in point, on February 1st, Phil Harrison, the man on whom the phrase failing upwards is based, announced that Google was shuttering all of their newly opened first-party development studios and that Stadia would pivot its strategy to third-party support. This was a gut punch to the hundreds of developers who joined Google's ranks, many of whom relocated to do so, but it was also a gut punch to anyone who backed Stadia with their dollars in the hope that it would become a platform full of unique cutting-edge experiences. Stadia continues to exist today, but only as a shadow of what was promised. Its meager library grows slowly, and Google have completely removed it from their marketing, going so far as to promote the Play Store at the Game Awards without uttering a peep about Stadia. Already, there are signs that Stadia will become a white-label solution that other game makers can utilize to bolster their cloud offering. But yeah, man, Stadia is effectively finished, and while it isn't dead enough to warrant a spot on the famous Killed by Google website, it certainly feels like it has one foot in the grave. February also saw the first example of a trend that I think really stood out in 2021, indie games getting their due. Valheim released in early access on February 2nd, and it went absolutely gangbusters. Within the first month, this thing had sold 5 million copies, and in August had sold 8 million. This is a game made by five people, and it is extraordinary. I'm going to talk more about this one in my game of the year list, believe me. What a month of releases! Loop Hero, Crash Bandicoot 4, Narita Boy, Monster Hunter Rise, and to top it all off, Balan Wonderworld. I never actually played Balan Wonderworld because I only heard the worst things about it and I wasn't going to waste my time, but I will say that it was interesting to see the reception to it. Yuji Naka led this project, and given how closely it adheres to his one-button design philosophy, you have to assume that all the worst parts of this game were essentially on him. But even then, it's like people weren't mad, they were just kind of sad. Naka is one of the industry's legends, credited as a co-creator of Sonic and leading teams of numerous Sonic sequels, Nights into Dreams, Fantasy Star games, etc. Pound for pound, there's only a handful of game makers with so impressive a CV, so to see him laid so low on this outing was a bummer. He's not done though, just this month he released a little smartphone game he made, and everyone was really supportive of that, so that was nice. See? We gamers aren't all bad. As if to continue the trend of things dying very slow deaths, this was the month that Anthem died. Again. First released back in 2019, Anthem epitomized absolutely everything that was wrong with AAA gaming. Crunch culture, deceptive marketing, trend chasing, and a woefully unfinished product. Anthem was DOA, and yet so compelling was its promise of Iron Man style gameplay that a small but vocal group of players fought to keep the game alive. When it was clear that minor game updates wouldn't be enough, EA Bioware announced that they had assembled a small team of people who were designing Anthem 2.0, a complete rebooting of the game from the ground up. That team got to work in 2020, putting out a few teaser updates here and there, but nothing much to cling to. The most media announcement came in February 2021, when the team announced that their pitch to EA's leadership had failed and that all further development work on Anthem would cease. It was a sad moment for a studio still reeling from the disappointing launch of Mass Effect Andromeda, but it did have its upside. It brought EA back from the brink of a live service Dragon Age game. The next installment in the fantasy franchise was being developed as a live service game, to which everyone said, fuck off. EA didn't care and went ahead with it anyway until the reality of Anthem's implosion was too compelling to ignore. Anthem died so that a single player offline Dragon Age game might live, and I guess we'll find out soon enough if that blood sacrifice was worth it. By the way, this is also the month that Roblox floated on the stock exchange at a market cap of $38 billion, making it larger than EA, Activision, or Ubisoft. Its current market cap? $59 billion. As I've mentioned many times in the past, Core gaming is chump change compared to stuff like Roblox or mobile gaming. April birthed one of the best, worst, craziest, most unbelievable stories of 2021, the Blue Box Conspiracy. 
Here's the story. Sony had secured the exclusive publishing rights to a game called Abandoned from a little known studio by the name of Blue Box. It was pretty weird that the studio from out of nowhere had secured a deal like this, so people started digging. Turns out this studio was created back in 2015, around the same time as it became clear that PT would never become an actual video game, owing to the fallout between Kojima and Konami. Back in 2012, Kojima had created a fake game studio as part of his plan to reveal Metal Gear 5, so perhaps this was him doubling down on his tricks and Abandon was really a Kojimbo plot to bamboozle us. Plus, there were the coincidences, like the name of the studio head, Hassan Karaman, has the same initials as Hideo Kojima, etc, etc. Pouring gasoline on this raging inferno, Blue Box were talking out of both sides of their mouth, in one breath denying any connection to Kojima or Silent Hill, but in the other breath tweeting out shit like this, which was obvious bait. Not to mention this eye-patched man here with the word abandoned written in Metal Gear font. Blue Box were playing with fire, and the entire thing was about to combust spectacularly. Frustrated by all the teasing, Reddit has dug even deeper to reveal that Karaman had a string of failed projects behind him, each of them over-promising and under-delivering. We got to experience that firsthand when Blue Box released their trailer app thing, which was just a five-second clip of some dude walking across a wooden floor, footage that had already been released to hype up the release of this trailer app. It was at this point that we were all done with Blue Box, and there was this silent collective agreement to never speak about this game or this studio ever again. I'm sorry I broke that pact, but I felt it was necessary. Want proof that time has absolutely no meaning in this COVID-addled world? Outriders released this year. My god, what the hell? Yes, Outriders did release, and I really liked it. It was just really, really busted. Like every single looter shooter in history, really, the most cursed genre of all time remains undefeated. Outriders was to become most famous for its curious habit of deleting all of your gear with absolutely no means of getting it back, exactly the sort of thing you'd want from a game demanding that you grind gear for hundreds of hours. It was also the month that Returnal released, but much like Valheim, I'll have more to say about this one later. According to review aggregate website Steam250, Resident Evil Village is the highest rated AAA game of the year with 96% of reviews positive out of 65,000 reviews counted. That is crazy. I didn't really like Village that much, but I am truly in awe of how perfectly Capcom managed to nail this one for basically everybody else. We spent like a year swapping memes about the big woman, and even though she was only in like a quarter of the game, people still ate it up. Resident Evil Village sits at this nexus between the action and goofiness of Resident Evil 4, the first person horror of Resident Evil 7, and the modern finishings of Resident Evil 2 Remake. It really seemed to reach out to Resident Evil fans and asks, what are your favorite things across this entire franchise? And and then it just builds a game entirely around those things. Like I said, I can't go back from the creepy trailer trash escape room stylings of Resident Evil 7, but Village was objectively one of the standout titles of the year, and it's nice to see how strong this franchise has remained in the 25 years since its debut. 25 years, my god. I remember playing this as a new release on my PlayStation after we rented it from Civic Video. I don't want to talk about that anymore, let's move on. May marked the beginning of the legal battle between Epic and, well, pretty much everybody really, but Apple in particular. Epic fired the shot heard around the world by deploying an update to Fortnite that would allow people to pay Epic directly, bypassing the 30% cut that Apple take as a storefront provider. Apple did what Epic knew they would do, deleted Fortnite from the App Store, allowing Epic to push the launch button on a truly cringe corporate propaganda campaign that involved not only this Apple parody trailer video Video thing, but actual hashtag free Fortnite influencer kits. Gross. Apple and Epic would tussle for most of the year with all sorts of juicy details spilling out during Discovery, like the fact that Epic was losing truckloads of money on the Epic Games Store and weren't expecting to turn a profit on it until like 2026 or something. Things didn't end up going Epic's way. When the ruling was eventually handed down, Epic got very little of what they were hoping for, and Apple can still basically charge 30% to whoever they want, though they do need to provide an option for additional payment methods now. Still, I think we need to give credit where it's due. The Epic Games Store is still a really shitty storefront, but their revenue split model forced Steam to revise their split for the first time ever, granting more money to indie developers in particular. Same goes for Apple, who revised their split for any app making under $1 million in revenue. The Epic court case may have been a particularly tasteless and out-of-touch example of corporate activism, but it did put more money in the pockets of hard-working indie devs, and for that I say, well done, Tim Sweeney. Oh, and Subnautica Below Zero released this month. I really ought to get around to reviewing that one one of these days. Game! 
June is always the most important month in gaming's hype calendar because that's when E3 happens. Except it kind of didn't happen in 2020 due to, you know, troubles. It kind of happened here in 2021, but I think this E3 was the perfect reminder of just how important these in-person events are. Sure, you can roll out these scripted, rehearsed, pre-recorded webinars that play game trailers, but where's the fun in that? In my E3 2021 video, I said that E3 was just as much about the people making the games as the games themselves. It's nice to see Hideo Kojima appear from behind a curtain it's nice to see the Doom Bros up there just loving the moment. Hell, it's nice to see the Todd up there, a man who seems to have an inexhaustible supply of leather jackets. There are exceptions to this, of course. One only need recall Randy Pitchford harassing staff on the set of the Borderlands movie to be reminded of that. But on the whole, it's nice to see the people who make the games present the games to us. And so I've never been a fan of this whole delete E3 movement, and I never will be. As COVID was still rocking the world of video games, E3 2021 was absent many of the heavy hitters that people were thirsting for, but it wasn't without its moments. We got a first look at Starfield, Stalker 2, indie title replaced stole the show and did you guys see that battlefield 2042 trailer holy shit that is gonna be so awesome when it comes out can't wait everyone groaned when square enix revealed guardians of the galaxy because we all just thought it was gonna be marvel's avengers 2.0 little did we know oh and we also got this little gem we're here to kill chaos the pc game show continues to hold the record for the longest feeling show it runs for three hours but it feels like it goes for 30. the capcom showcase was essentially nothing and the 2k showcase was an HR Zoom meeting, and if you think I'm lying, go back and watch it. Unbelievable. Nintendo seemed to win E3 almost by default, as the absence of impressive announcements from other publishers allowed Nintendo to saunter in with a reveal for Metroid Dread and a sizzle reel for Breath of the Wild 2. Video game retailer GameStop would release a list of the top 10 most pre-ordered games following E3, and six of the 10 spots were taken by Nintendo titles, and three of those were remakes or remasters. To be fair though, Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance was number 8 on that list, so I don't think we should put too much stock in it. June wasn't just about the hype though, it also served up some of the best games of the year. Stuff like Chivalry 2 reminded us that the thrill of dismemberment is timeless. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was probably the most technically impressive game of the entire year, showcasing the power of next-gen storage in a way we'd never seen before. Guilty Gear Strive took the fighting game community by storm, and the superb Wildermyth's procedurally generated spin on the classic hero's journey won many a heart, and many an award actually, as the game went on to become one of the most critically acclaimed games of the year. July started off really well. We got a look at that fancy new Steam Dick from Gaben. I gotta say, I never would have predicted this announcement before, but yeah, it actually makes a lot of sense. I use my Switch as a little indie machine since the Switch hardware is so old it struggles to run any new 3D game above like 15 FPS. So I stick to the low res, low polygon count indies that I know my Switch can handle. The comfort, the convenience, it's great. The problem is that I'm buying games through Nintendo, which means that when they do transition to a new generation of Nintendo hardware, they're gonna make us buy all our games all over again. That might have been fine in the past, but I think we're getting a lot more protective of our library investment these days. Enter the Steam Deck, all of the convenience of a Nintendo handheld with none of the Nintendo bullshit. I'm still happy to buy Nintendo stuff for their excellent first party offerings, but the Steam Deck means I'll never need to buy another third party game on a Nintendo system ever again, fingers crossed, and I'm very happy about that. Now now all we need is for Gaming to agree to launch this thing in Australia. Man lives in New Zealand for God's sake. Is this some kind of payback for all the New Zealand jokes we made over here? It's fair enough. Sometimes we, we do take things a bit too far. Speaking of companies I don't want to buy products from anymore. Activision Blizzard. In the final week of July, the state of California brought suit against one of the pillars of the gaming industry, Activision Blizzard, the largest video games company in the United States and home to some of the most successful IP in video games history. The suit alleged an ingrained culture of sexism, harassment, sexual assault, workplace bullying, racial discrimination, and a raft of other deeply troubling claims. These stories weren't isolated, they were systemic, and the costs weren't just in CV line items or dollars, they were, at least in one instance, fatal. Activision Blizzard leadership would scramble to contain this, only doing more damage in the process. They sent out dismissive emails to staff and the press, and they ignored workers' demands. As the crisis deepened, Bobby Kotick would make a blood sacrifice of Blizzard President J. Allen Brack, a move that seemed commendable at the time, but now seems deeply hypocritical, as subsequent reporting has revealed Bobby Kotick's complicity in Activision's culture issues, with him going so far as to intervene to protect sexual harassers, not to mention the one time he told his PA that he would have her killed. You know, 
just normal bants from a billionaire CEO to his staff member. The ripple effect of this lawsuit has been felt at every corner of the video games industry. Ubisoft had earlier provoked a conversation about the way that abusers can be protected by companies. Riot Games provoked a similar conversation when its workplace culture issues were revealed, but Activision Blizzard's issues have really struck a nerve and opened up the conversation far more widely than before. Developers were sharing their stories across social media, the Game Awards were distancing themselves from Activision Blizzard, workers began to talk of unionizing, and this year, the first ever video games workers union was formed in North America. The Activision Blizzard story is the defining story of 2021, and I know at least some people didn't want to hear about it. Each week I would get dozens and dozens of comments like, talk about the games, not this bullshit. These comments really bum me out because there are no fucking video games without the people who make them. If we're going to sit there for hundreds or thousands of hours a year playing the stuff these people make for us, then the least we can do is give a shit at least a little bit if it turns out that at least some of them were being abused while they were making these products. The flip side to that is people who say, don't talk about any of these games from these companies at all. Just go full blackout boycott. I don't subscribe to that either. If these developers are going to work for years and years in abusive environments, then I don't want to pretend that the thing they suffered to make doesn't exist. It's a slightly unpopular opinion, but it's one I've reached after personally speaking to many developers who work at Activision, Blizzard, Ubisoft, and other studios. There are no easy solutions to this for anyone involved, but I think it's important that everyone fumbles their way through this towards a better future for developers. And as shit a year as 2021 was, this ironically was one of the better parts of it better out than in, as they say. Hopefully, it leads to things improving. And hopefully, Bobby Kotick resigns, because my god, I cannot fucking believe that this guy is still CEO. September marks the beginning of the year-end release cycle. It's like your wallet starts an unnecessary crash diet where it's kind of healthy and normal in September, but by late November, it's flat and wrinkled and emaciated. I mean, this was when Tales of Arise hit. Easily the most beloved JRPG of the year, in a year where there were plenty of fantastic JRPGs. Persona 5 Strikers, Near Replicant, Neo The World Ends With You, Monster Hunter Stories 2, Scarlet Nexus, Bravely Default 2, and of course, Shin Megami Tensei 5. Many have remarked that we're in a golden age of JRPGs, and while one year doesn't make an age, one year can certainly mark the start of an age. And if the next few years deliver anything close to what 2021 delivered, then the future of the JRPG subgenre is looking very bright indeed. Kana Bridge of Spirits arrived after what was a very clandestine review process, but for once our paranoia was just that, and the game was truly superb. An absolute home run debut for the studio, and perhaps the best example of how narrow the gap between indie and AAA is, since Kana served up visuals and cutscenes that most AAA games would have killed to deliver. The Diablo 2 remaster came and disappeared like a fart in the wind, Hot Wheels Unleashed was way better than it had any right to be, and the Echoes of the Eye expansion to the Outer Wilds was a nice, subtle reminder of why Outer Wilds is the greatest video game ever made. More on that one in my Game of the Year video as well. I think we need to give Amazon's new world credit where it's due. It's rare that a game could cook a 3090 graphics card, so hats off for that. Seriously though, New World launched in September and it went absolutely gangbusters. The peak concurrent play count for New World was nearly a million people. Only a handful of games have ever come close to that. So for a brand new MMO based on entirely original IP to have hit those numbers is insane. And it shows all the talk about the death of the MMO genre is greatly exaggerated, a point that would get a few more exclamation marks come December. New World will go on to suffer from all of the problems that newly launched MMO games would suffer from, with things getting so bad that the developers had to literally disable the economy for the game for an extended period because it was just so busted. But you know what the real story of New World is? This is Steam Charts today, 27th of December, two days after Christmas when people should all be playing their new games. New World is the fourth most played game on Steam, with roughly 90,000 current players. The story of New World isn't, lol, look how busted this game is. The story is, wow, look how much staying power this game has, despite the fact that it's completely broken. Amazon had a very rough road towards their first home run, but they hit it and they hit it hard with New World. I don't expect we're going to see a sudden revivification of the MMO genre the way we did in the early 2000s, but I do think the case for new MMO games is now a lot stronger thanks to New World's success. And that's a good thing, because with WoW in its death throes, Final Fantasy XIV needs some good competition to keep it on its toes. Perfect. October had some banger stories. Remember Konami's eFootball, the game so bad it went on to become the single lowest rated game on all of Steam? Remember that Twitch leak where everyone's income was leaked so everyone was like, oh, I can't believe how much money they earn, even though you could already see their sub count, and then you just times that by three to get the earnings. Why was that a story? Remember Nintendo launching that horrendously overpriced online upgrade thing that 
I don't know, probably millions of people bought that because, you know, Nintendo fans do what normal people don't. Remember when Genshin Impact did that cringy Elon Musk cross-promotion thing even though he was never consulted? And when everyone dunked on them, they just deleted the tweet and pretended like it never existed? We remember, okay? We, we know that happened. And yes, it was very embarrassing. Bitterly sweetly, Sakurai presented us with the final Smash character reveal in October. And while fans were generally overjoyed to see Sora finally in Smash, they were more sad to know that this would probably be the last time they'd see Sakurai before them, a controller in each hand, politely introducing the next chapter in his life's work. With decades of service to this franchise, Sakurai has certainly earned himself a restful retirement. Whether he'll choose to take it though is another matter entirely. Far Cry 6 released this month. I always thought it was quite interesting the way that everyone in almost unison declared that enough was enough and that it was time for Far Cry to evolve. I mean, it wasn't like 4 or 5 were that different, but come 6 everyone was like, whoa, okay, back it up guy, that's enough. I have no idea what Far Cry 7 is going to end up being, but I'm not even playing it unless it's a proper shakeup because I'm definitely done with Far Cry at this point. While Far Cry belly flopped in the originality category, Ubisoft stuck the landing with Riders Republic, genuinely one of the great surprises of the year. Not the greatest though. That title goes to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the most well-written, well-paced, well-scored and well-made games of the entire year. Spoiler alert. That's on my game of the year list too. October ended with a strange piece of news. Valve were banning any game using cryptocurrencies or NFTs. Huh, not sure what those words mean, but that's okay, never mind. I'm sure we'll never need to think about those words ever again. Surprise, everything is now an NFT that you buy with bullshit internet monopoly money so that you can look cool even when you're playing fake poker in your space station with Mark Zuckerberg and the people he paid to pretend to be his friends. That's right. Facebook, the worst company on the planet, thought they'd seal the deal and have the worst company name on the planet too. Meta. With one awkward cringe-inducing video, the sentient synth we call the Zuck outlined a vision of the future that feels equally terrifying and inevitable. The metaverse is something a range of companies have been slowly working towards, particularly the likes of Epic and Roblox, but Facebook throwing their full weight behind it was the rocket fuel that supercharged this movement. And overnight, it felt like every brand was buying up fake real estate in whatever 2021 version of Second Life they could get their hands on. I know the metaverse seems like a distant dream right now, but companies are going to be spending billions to make sure it sneaks up on you real fast so don't blink or you'll miss it. Happy to follow Blizzard down the path of thoroughly half ass remakes, Rockstar released the GTA Definitive Edition in November, but the only thing definitive about it was how much it fucking sucked. We don't really talk enough about what a greedy, scummy, low down, price gouging, anti-consumer company Take-Two is, because most core gamers wouldn't touch GTA Online with a 40 foot barge pole, and most casual gamers simply don't know any better. But Take-Two are a really scummy operation, and we got a taste of that when we saw these bargain bin mobile port remasters. The fact that they took down the previous versions of the game and DMCA struck community mods tells you everything you need to know about what their intentions were here. And it's frustrating to know that this chapter will be but a tiny blip in their financials as GTA 5 continues to be basically the best selling game of the year every year on every platform. Seriously, look it up. Outside of this, I think the most interesting thing about November was that it saw the release of the three great shooters of our time, and each of them imploded for completely different reasons. Call of Duty Vanguard was, by all accounts, a pretty competent entry, but it just didn't appeal to anyone. Another World War II game, after so many of them these past few years, Activision just made the wrong bet here, and COD Vanguard sold around 40% less than last year's COD. Battlefield 2042 was a genuine tragedy, because it felt like almost an ending point for the franchise? That sounds kind of dramatic, but for real, from a design perspective, this Battlefield is a radical departure from anything before, and many of the DICE employees who made this franchise great left the company at the end of Battlefield 1 or Battlefield 5. 2042 was a changing of the guard, and the reinforcements did not deliver. Add to that the fact that the game was missing so many features from previous entries, and it was woefully unfinished, needing at least another 6, maybe 12 months to get ready for launch, Battlefield 5 now has a higher daily average player count than Battlefield 2042. Truly an ignoble fate for a new release multiplayer game to be abandoned in favor of its predecessor. I don't know where Battlefield 2042 goes from here. I expect kind of nowhere. The hit this game took at launch feels terminal, and I wonder if EA aren't thinking more about the sequel than they are live service support. Finally, as if to save us all from this disappointment, the Master Chief thawed himself from Cryo and ODST dropped himself into an all new adventure. Six years after the disappointing Halo 5, Halo Infinite rode high on a wave of hype owing to a brilliant beta, tight gameplay, and a beautifully polished release which felt like a rarity in this modern age of AAA gaming. While the campaign would meet near universal acclaim, the multiplayer was a more complex question 
question owing to the transition to free to play. It's inarguable that much of Halo's progression was designed to nickel and dime the player base, using frustration as a threatening stick with which to beat players into submission. You could queue into 50 quick play matches hoping to get capture the flag rounds so that you could complete your kill 10 flag carriers in PvP challenge, or you could just sling Microsoft a couple of bucks and get a few levels of the battle pass. Your choice. With free to play, a lot of people got Halo that wouldn't have got it, but a lot of other people permanently lost a version of Halo that was complete and full of things to earn for the low price of $60. Halo is exceptional, I love it, but it remains to be seen just how much value this new live service model delivers over and above what we've enjoyed these past two decades. December was like that Froggit gag from The Simpsons, like, It Takes Two wins Game of the Year at the Game Awards. That's good. But Activision just sacked a bunch of minimum wage workers for no good reason. That's bad. We're getting a new Splinter Cell game. That's good. It's probably going to have NFTs in it. That's bad. Can I go now? October introduced us to the concept of NFTs in gaming, and November showed us that companies were really serious about it, while December showed us just how ready companies were to get in on this newly discovered grift. Case in point, Ubisoft unveiled Quartz to thunderous booing and an avalanche of dislikes. Remember when we could dislike YouTube videos? Good times. I get asked a lot why people such as myself are so against NFTs in games, and it's a complex topic, but let me put it this way. Imagine if every game had some version of the Diablo 3 real money auction house. Imagine if the game you love was perverted by market forces so that the things you want are forever out of your grasp because you don't have more dollars in your bank account than the dude outbidding you. Imagine your game flooded with bots and currency farmers and speculators who don't give a fuck about the game itself. They are just there for the resale value of the digital items. That is the future of video games if NFTs ever take root. And all the monkey avatars on Twitter promising you some pay to earn utopia where you can get rich through the power of NFTs is just playing their role in the pyramid scheme that this is. It's been heartening to see just how quickly and how strongly people are pushing back on this. It reminds me of the Great Loot Box War of 2018, a campaign so successful that loot boxes have all but vanished from core gaming. I hope we meet similar success here, but with an army of evangelists on the player side, all offering full-throated support backed by get-rich-quick promises, I suspect this battle will be a lot more tricky. And then, at our lowest point, when it seemed all hope had faded, Derplander appeared. The release of Final Fantasy XIV and Walker wasn't like the release of previous expansions. The game had flown completely under people's radars until Shadowbringers, at which point a critical mass was hit, and people started talking about the fact that this game, this story, this world, this was one of the all-time greats, MMO or otherwise. It would be another two years before the spectacular combustion of World of Warcraft would lead to a new influx of fans, this time led by some of the largest content creators in the world. When Endwalker hit, people were there, they were keen, they were ready. The problem is that the servers weren't. Final Fantasy XIV's population well, well exceeded server capacity, and so people were forced to endure hour-long queues, or just couldn't queue at all because the game was like, sorry, we're full, come back later. The climax of this story is quite hilarious. The game was so popular that Square Enix had to temporarily stop selling it and pull all advertising. Insane. The success of Final Fantasy XIV has become a bit of a meme, which is cool, but it also kind of sucks because part of the joke is predicated on just how rare the ethos of this development team is. This is a team of people who have always put players first, who have always prioritized quality over quantity, who have always respected their community, and have always respected the time and money that people invest into this game. Final Fantasy XIV isn't unique in this regard, since a lot of games in the indie space already do this, but in the world of AAA gaming, I just can't think of another development team who is delivering at the level that these people are. I love Final Fantasy XIV for the game that it is, but I love it just as much, or maybe more, for the example it sets to the rest of the industry. At the end of the year, I like to step back and reflect on what the legacy of each year might be. How will we talk about 2021 in the years to come? I don't think we'll look back on 2021 particularly fondly. 
2020 was the year we were supposed to get through COVID, but 2021 showed us that we still had way more to go. Hell, we haven't even hit the hangover phase yet, and 2022 and 2023 are still going to be lived in large part under the shadow cast by the pandemic. Video games aren't immune from the virus any more than we humans are. As supply chain challenges persist, it's still, over 12 months later, almost impossible to buy a next-gen console unless it's from one of those scalping outfits. God, I hate those guys. 2021 was also absent the flagship heavy hitters that can define a year. The Game of the Year award was a genuine toss-up this year, not because there were five games that all transformed and expanded video games as a medium, but because there were no games that did that this year, so we had to pick from a less impactful field of candidates. That's not to say that there weren't great games to be enjoyed, because there were. Many will argue that 2021 was a shit year for video games, but I don't agree with that. I just don't think it was quite as good as others. It Takes Two, and Returnal, and Resident Evil Village, and Endwalker, and Ratchet and Clank, what are they? Chop liver? No. They are great games that deserve respect and recognition. But none of them shook the industry the way that Sekiro did, or God of War, or Red Dead did, or Breath of the Wild did. We'll have to wait a little longer for the likes of those. I think the biggest legacy of 2021 will be the way it put working conditions of developers at the centre of the conversation. It's not the first time we've been talking about it. The well-documented crunch culture of game makers was revealed years prior, and workplace culture issues at Ubisoft and Riot Games revealed how difficult an experience many women and non-binary people are having. But with Activision Blizzard, it felt like the foghorn was just too loud to ignore, and so most of us listened in a way that we hadn't before. It's not fun, but it's good, because through that listening, we learn. 2021 was the year the industry swallowed that hard-to-swallow pill, and already we're seeing many developers commit to providing a better environment for staff. Selfishly, we can celebrate that, because happy staff means better games. But I think more importantly, we can celebrate it because it's important to care about the well-being of the people who make the things that we love. For me, rough as it was, I had a good year because I'm just glad that I got to talk about all the games and happenings of 2021 with all of you. I never forget how lucky I am to have this career, playing games, sharing my love of them with you, and speaking to you through comments and Twitter and whatever else about the things that you enjoy. I'm nothing without my editor, Austin, and if you guys enjoy This Week in Video Games or the reviews at all, it's only because Austin takes my awful recordings and manages to bang them into something coherent. A huge thank you to him, and a huge thank you to you for watching. Tune in a few days from now for my Game of the Year video, after which time Austin and I will take a well-earned break until mid-January. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace have re-signed to the channel for another 12 months. Very appreciative of that support, that is amazing. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career, and that's what they do for a lot of people, because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is a really good place to start. Maybe you want to start writing. Squarespace lets you create a professional looking blog in minutes so you can immediately begin publishing your work and sharing it around. Maybe you want to open an online store and start selling stuff you've made or you're importing. Squarespace lets you set up online storefronts with ease and they look fantastic, super professional, and they're also backed by end-to-end e-commerce features so you can start taking and managing payments in no time. Maybe you want to create a community page for your Halo clan or your local chess club. Squarespace can handle that too as it's got an event scheduler that allows you to organize and invite people to stuff you want to do. Squarespace does it all. It's a one-stop shop for that next thing you want to do with your hobby, your career, or just because you feel like it. To get started, visit squarespace.com. And if you want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.